On the topic of immigration, we turn to a panel of guests who know the issue from a few different angles. We'll begin with Rafael Carranza from the Arizona Republic, Patricia Mejia, an immigration attorney, and Sheriff Mark Napier from here in Pima County. My thanks to all of you for being here. Let's begin with you, Patricia. We're talking about DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. We heard a lot about it over the last few months, and suddenly it's sort of stopped. Where is it now? Well, it's up to Congress, really, to decide what's going to happen with it. There was a March 5th deadline. Um, that's when DACA was supposed to expire. It was stuck in the course. There were a few decisions. There was an injunction against the ending of the program, two injunctions. And so right now it remains open, but with an uncertain future. Rafael, you've been covering the border for a few years now. Fair to say lives are in limbo when we don't know what to expect for these cases. Yeah, and what's interesting about that is that uh, you know, we, we saw DACA kind of being used as a, as a bartering tool, you know, kind of tit for tat. We give you this, you give you that during the negotiations, which ultimately stalled. And what we saw uh, with the passage of the latest omnibus spending bill is that one of the key provisions that the Trump administration was asking for, uh, which is more money for border security, um, they approved money for that. But what they were asking for in exchange, the protections for DREAMers, was completely left out. Sheriff, when we talk about federal funding, uh, your office has sort of been in the hot seat recently over some of the federal funding that you see. Where is that now, and how does the Pima County Sheriff's Department move on without federal dollars to support border work? Well, our, our federal grant, our Stone Garden grant, was approved conditionally, and we responded to some concerns that the community had, which I think were valid. Mm -hmm. And I thought the political process actually worked. We were disappointed it was initially turned down, but the uh, remediation process to uh, reconsider that actually was positive. So we um, spoke to the ACLU and, and other uh, interested parties and said, what could we do to alleviate some of your concerns? And we've, been, uh, we've done those things. So we've got our Stone Garden funding back, and um, we still have uh, issues with SCAP funding, um, which has diminished significantly over the last 10 years. And so we still have a tremendous responsibility with respect to public safety in Pima County regarding the border. We have a 125 mile linear exposure in the international border. A good portion of that is on the Tonawata Reservation. And a lot of that is exceptionally rural. What irritates me are politicians that go to a port of entry and have a photo op and say they've been to the border. Uh, that's not the border. That's not the front line of where we're having the most difficulties. What percentage of your work would you say is border, border related? Well, it's difficult to quantify that because there are so many uh, nuances to that um, issue. I would say 20% uh, is probably not uh, missing it too far that has some relationship to the border in some manner. A lot of public safety concerns come up through the border, whether it be human trafficking, drug trafficking, or other transnational crime threats. And what we don't talk about enough, which is a, is a major factor for us, is the human rights tragedy. Uh, my deputies recover about 150 bodies a year in the deserts of western Pima County, and those are only the bodies we recover. Um, no one will ever know how many people are out there. Patricia, has, have the numbers changed very much over the years? You've been doing this more than 10 years now where you, there was a hot time, you know, yes. back in 2005, 2008. Has it tapered down since then? I believe so. In the last few years, we've seen a decline. But like the sheriff said, it could be that people are just not found. They have to find different routes to be able to cross. So they tend to cross now through more remote areas. So. You know, they could be dying at the same rate. We just do not recover the bodies. And Rafael, for a long time, Arizona was sort of ground zero. And from what I understand, looking at the numbers, it still is in certain respects. How does it compare with other states in the Southwest? When it comes to the deaths of border migrants, um, Arizona is still very much, uh, you know, one of the hot spots, I guess, so, so to speak, especially in the areas of uh, western Pima County, um, the area near Ajo, those desert areas. Um, however, we've seen the traffic of uh, people kind of switching it up, it's now moving more towards Texas, and as a result, we've seen a lot more of those border deaths happening in Texas as well. Um, there was a report that just came out a few weeks ago from the uh, International Organization for Migration. They tracked the number of deaths all along the U.S.-Mexico border, and they found that Texas um, had the largest number of deaths, and a lot of them were concentrated in South Texas in particular. Um, but Arizona is still very much a deadly corridor for this type of trafficking and for deaths along the border. And, and we're seeing an increase in, in OTMs other than Mexicans. Of so a lot of traffic coming up from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, because of the desperation of the people, mm -hmm. especially in El Salvador with the rise of MS-13 uh, taking hold in El Salvador, is people are making very desperate decisions. And while we can all agree that people should follow the law and all of that, 
um, people are in a state of desperation that many of us might make similar decisions to protect our families, to provide a better life for our, our families, or to get our families out of these very desperate situations. And what really pulls at my heartstrings is some of these people begin to walk north, and two or three years later, my deputies might find a skull and a leg bone, and their families will never know, and will never know who that was or what happened to that person. And this is a human rights tragedy. I mean, I, I really um, speak strongly about that every time I have an opportunity to speak to border issues because I don't think we talk enough about that. One of the key criticisms um, about, from, about the government is that um, the strategy that's being used at this point, the government for the past few, a decade or so, has built uh, stronger physical barriers in a lot of the more transited areas. It's still a, a process that's underway, especially in South Texas now. We're seeing a lot of these high priority areas where they're building more fencing and more infrastructure. Critics say that, you know, that's ultimately just pushing migrants more towards these dangerous routes and causing, you know, more deaths. And what we've seen over the past few years is that the number of apprehensions or people trying to cross the border illegally has gone down drastically. Uh, but the number of deaths has remained steady or slightly increased. Patricia, you've been working with these families for many years now. What do you think needs to happen to, to as the sheriff and Rafael are both saying, to change the course of the conversation? Well, I think there needs to be a, di uh, a nationwide dialogue about immigration and where do we stand as people, as, as this country? Like, do we welcome new people and what process do we need to use to welcome these people who are already here. Many, there, As we know, there are at least 21 million people who are here undocumented. So do we just ignore them? Do we create a program? What, what does this program look like? So we need to come up with a solution. Um, I think a program that it starts with uh, employment authorization for a few years, similar to DACA, I suppose, and then eventually people, maybe we need to be tested to you know, become permanent residents, they need to be vetted for criminal activity and all that, and then eventually hopefully become citizens. But um, it's, I think it's cruel and unrealistic to just ignore like millions of people in the country, and they go in the shadows, they don't report crimes, they, they go underground. Some people are afraid to even go to the hospitals these days, and uh, you know, that's not, I don't believe that's who we want to be as, as a nation. Sheriff, is that true? Have you found that people are, are hesitant to contact law enforcement because of their status? Well, we don't know what we don't know is the problem, and, and um, I certainly, have, I've been a police officer for more than 30 years, and when I would go to a crime where a person was a victim of crime, I didn't ask about immigration status, it's irrelevant to their victimization. Um, so, and I hope that my deputies will follow suit in that it's, it's not part of what we're investigating, it's not part of our mandate to adopt federal immigration responsibilities. It's something that's fundamentally got to be addressed. Sanctuary cities are dangerous, and we're gonna take care of the problem. Thank you all very much. Sanctuary cities is something we've heard a lot about. Do we have designated sanctuary cities in Arizona or places that resemble such? The hard part about that is defining what a sanctuary city is simply because there's no clear one definition of what that entails. I mean, there's sort of these agreed standards of what it could be, and it generally seems to be, you know, they're limiting their cooperation with federal authorities when it comes to immigration. I don't know that any Arizona cities itself would fall under sanctuary cities, which is why we haven't really seen a lot of the, that focus about that debate here in the state. It usually, it usually falls on um, states like California, a lot of the cities there. They've approved a lot of legislation uh, towards that regard, but we haven't seen that play out here in our state. Sheriff, it's risky to designate as a sanctuary city. I mean, there are actual dollars that are associated with that title. There are. Um, the federal government has uh, decided that it would potentially withhold uh, burn JAG grant money, uh, which a lot of uh, law enforcement agencies live on. I have a philosophical problem with sanctuary cities in that there are three branches of government, a, a branch that enforces laws, a branch that interprets laws, and a branch that makes laws. And I really don't think we want uh, law enforcement leaders deciding which laws to follow and which laws don't. I think it's a slippery slope, and even as a law enforcement executive, I'm not comfortable with empowering law enforcement to say, I like this law, but I don't like this law, I'll follow this law, but not that law. I, I really think that we need to keep that separate. And do laws need to be changed? I think thoughtful discourse would say that probably we do need to make some modifications. I agree with the sheriff that there has to be discourse and uh, we need to address this issue sooner or later. Um, and I agree that, I mean, it is difficult for, from his perspective, to say we're gonna ignore some laws. We want to, we wanna act from heart, we wanna protect people, but at the same time, you, you get to decide which ones do you ignore, which ones do you enforce. What are you hearing from people that you cover these stories with? What are some of their big concerns right now? 
I think just the biggest concern for a lot of the DACA recipients is obviously their future and, and what it means. Obviously, they, the, the fact that they have DACA gives them a permit to work so they're able to legally contribute to the economy. There's also a lot of questions when it comes to what's going to happen to the information that the government already has about the DACA recipients. Obviously, they had to apply, provide their address and all these information so that they could qualify. And so now that the government has that, what's going to happen to that info? What we've heard from the Trump administration is that they're not going to share that info um, for enforcement purposes. Sheriff, this political uncertainty that we're in right now, how does that affect your work as a law enforcement agent? Well, there's a lot of rhetoric flying around, and so we really don't know where public policy will land. So it's a, a moving target for law enforcement. Um, there's a lot of talk about um, you know, creating barriers on our southern border. Um, I think that the terminology of the wall gets in the way of, of solutions. Um, I'm a proponent of securing the border because it is a public, self, a public uh, safety issue. It's a national security issue, but all ultimately it's a human rights issue um, because we are channeling people into very dangerous environments and people are losing their lives and that's a human rights issue. I think it's really incumbent upon especially larger agency uh, CEOs like myself to, to be engaged in Washington DC and to help guide public policy. I've been in Washington DC in the last month twice interacting with senators and, and policymakers because they have to hear from us. And you mentioned that earlier that a politician comes down for a quick photo op and they leave but here we are always in the border and we understand these issues. I want to um, wrap this up with sort of your final thoughts on what you think needs to happen to take this conversation to the next to the next level. Rafael, we'll start with you. I, I'd have to add saying that I think right now there seems to be very little appetite to address these issues. We're aware that there's you know, there was a sense of urgency when there was a sort of deadline imposed when it came to March 5th and whatnot, but um, that sort of fizzled out and, and Congress seems very reticent at this time to try to retake that. I don't see something moving along very fast until say maybe in September or so when the next round of funding you know, comes, comes to light again or if we hear something that's decided in court. Okay, Patricia, time is no longer of the essence? No, it's, it doesn't look like it is. And I would say uh, it's important to keep in mind what is at stake here for members of our community. I think uh, there are many, many families here um, who live in fear, who are afraid sometimes to drive to the store to just even buy groceries. Um, there are people who don't know if they should enroll in school for the next semester. I mean, this affects people deeply. Um, it affects their daily lives. It causes depression. It causes constant fear. So we need to, sooner or later, we're going to have to confront this issue. Sooner or later, hopefully by September, hopefully by the end of the year, at some moment in time, we're going to come to face to face with it and, and have to just make difficult decisions. And I hope that day comes soon because these people need resolution. They need to know where they stand. Are they going to stay or are they going to go? And what happens next? It's too difficult to live with such uncertainty on a daily level. Sheriff, you're in law enforcement, but you're also in the political world now. Mm -hmm. Is there a will to do this? You know, I've been in, in this uh, area for more than 30 years, and I keep seeing the can kick down the road. I hear heated rhetoric, um, sound bites, but what I don't hear is good public policy discussion. This is not a Democrat or Republican issue. There's enough blame to go around. And it's time to fix this. It's time to remove the uncertainty from so many people that live in this country and have made a life in this country. We have to remember that this is an election year. Midterm elections are at stake yes. in November. And so mm -hmm. since it is such a polarizing issue that's going to alienate people one way or another, it's very sensitive and no politician that's up for re-election is going to want to touch this. Well, and Raphael's correct because if you're in the center, you get hit in both cheeks. <laughs> um, and that's, that's a problem. Uh, I tend to be pretty centrist on this stuff. I'm about what's good public policy. So people on the far right are angry with me and people on the far left are mad at me. So you get hit from both sides. But that's what people elected me to be the sheriff of this county to do is to try to follow my conscience, my education, and my experience to guide good public policy.